Hello, my name is Maurice Kugler. I'm professor of public policy at the Schar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And I'm here to present research that has come out of the Jobs Watch project, which is a project to monitor the COVID-19 labor market impact uh, which was conducted by the World Bank with a high frequency phone surveys to gauge the jobs impact on 40 countries by doing these surveys uh, on real time to see how we could get information on how workers were doing as a result of the pandemic. And this paper is answering the question of how did the COVID-19 crisis affect different types of workers in the developing world? Is joint work with staff and consultants at the World Bank, which include Mariana Violas, Daniel Duque, Isis Gadis, David Newhouse, Amparo Palacios Lopez, and Michael Weber, an interdisciplinary group that worked a little bit under a year on conducting this research to assess the labor market impacts to identify which groups were hit hardest by the pandemic in terms of employment and wages. So the big question is which types of workers were most affected by the COVID-19 crisis? And the objectives are first to analyze the initial impacts of the pandemic on employment indicators for different types of social demographic groups by gender, age, education, and location, uh, differentiating by rural and urban. In 40 developing countries, as I mentioned, using the high frequency phone surveys, which were collected by the World Bank. And we will do some robustness checks in which we evaluate the performance of reweighting methods in minimizing the bias due to non-representativeness of the sample, which comes about the fact that we are focusing on certain households that uh, have at least one member who has a phone that have access to electricity and which had willingness to participate in the survey and these households will over represent household heads and under represent children in the sampling methodology and of course this will induce a certain possibility of selection bias. So um, to preview our main findings, uh, we see that the groups that are hit the hardest and bear the brunt of the burden in terms of how uh, they are impacted by the labor market impacts of the COVID-19 crisis are women first and foremost, uh, as well as young workers and those with uh, less education, the workers with only primary education are hit hardest and also to some extent, urban workers. So those are the groups that are hit the hardest and um, in particular, we see a big gender gap with women bearing most of the brunt in terms of the burden of the labor market impacts that arise in terms of employment uh, impacts for, of the COVID-19 crisis on labor markets. This is a very important finding that corroborates information that is also found uh, for developed countries using other sources of data, such as labor market uh, surveys. And uh, it's important that for developing countries, 
we find similar patterns. And um, we look at the potential reasons for this pattern. And in terms of the gender gap in work stoppage, we explore a couple of potential explanations um, in terms of the mechanisms that might be driving the gender gap in terms of the employment impact being much larger for women than for men. And the first mechanism that we explore is gender differences in care and domestic responsibilities. And for this impact, we conduct a Oaxaca blinder decomposition um, in terms of the uh, characteristics of different households and um, different women uh, who are impacted by the crisis. And um, we also do a pre-pandemic sectoral gender segregation analysis to see if it's the women being disproportionately allocated in sectors in terms of their employment that are hit hardest by the pandemic that explains the fact that they have a burden in terms of loss of employment, which is much harder than that experienced by men in terms of job loss. So in terms of the first explanation, we find that the contribution of the children learning activities is negative or small. So the Oaxaca blinder decomposition essentially uh, reveals that we cannot attribute the fact that uh, children uh, had to stop going to school and were doing virtual schooling or were staying at home or had to be looked after as an explanation for women having to stop work. So in many cases, there was actually an added worker effect which made children have to join the labor force themselves. So in many countries, they didn't even induce a burden in terms of daycare, but were rather having to become wage earners themselves. So this is possibly an explanation why in developing countries, uh, the contribution of learning activities is negative or small in terms of explaining the fact that women had to abandon employment. And then the second explanation in terms of gender differences arising because of sector of pre-pandemic employment, they only explain 10% of the observed gap. So it's a minimal factor in the explanation for the loss of employment by women. So women are not losing jobs because they are in the sectors that are being hit hardest, which were obviously the service sectors, the hospitality sectors. Um, they were, uh, compared to men, uh, just as likely to be in sectors that uh, were being hit very hard by the pandemic um but uh, it's rather a within sector story it's not a story across sectors that women were working in the wrong sectors and that's why the covid-19 pandemic hit them hardest in terms of labor market outcomes so women were more likely to stop working than men employed in the same economic sectors so they were the first to lose their jobs in terms of uh, basically having to stop working because they were the first to be dismissed. And perhaps that can have something to do with uh, some sort of discrimination or some sort of uh, segregation 
within sectors, not across sectors. So coming to the next point, in general, no marked differentials in the change of employment or sectoral employment patterns in terms of wages, except in terms of age differentials. And here you can see that when you compare in terms of gender or level of education or urban versus rural location, uh, the average changes in the share of wage uh, employees earned by groups, uh, it's not substantial. It's essentially uh, very similar, except uh, there is a disproportional fall in the wage employment for the youth who uh, experience a large increase in their share of uh, self-employment. And um, they lose the possibility of being in a job and they become self-employed and to a large extent join the ranks of the informal sector and this lower wage reflects lower levels of job security for uh, young workers, and it's related to a loss of tenure among them. So this is important to point out that for young workers, there is an important loss in terms of the wage. Now, coming to the recovery that was observed in the third quarter of 2020, uh, we see uh, disproportionate gains for the groups that were hit the hardest initially. And this is especially true for women who you can see here um, in October, uh, had an employment gains of um, about 38% compared to men um, at a much lower uh, 23%. Uh, also, youth had disproportionate gains of 34% as compared to 29% for adult populations. And um, also the low educated had 44% gains as opposed to 28%. And to a lesser extent, Orban also enjoyed an edge in the employment gains in uh, August between April and October um, as opposed to the rural populations. So we see that there was to some extent a rebound for the groups that were hit hardest during the second quarter of 2020, the first and second quarter of 2020, um, but mainly the first quarter. And um, those groups that were hit hardest during the first quarter of 2020 were able to rebound from April to October. However, there is a caveat in terms of the limitations of the data because we're not able to observe the quality of those employment gains. We don't know if they come back to jobs that are of similar quality to the jobs lost initially or if the jobs that they come back to are sort of gig economy jobs that are precarious and that are transient and that don't have the same quality of benefits and of uh, remuneration as the original jobs. So that's a limitation of the data in terms of gauging how robust this rebound is. So coming to a methodological point in terms of the robustness, of the high frequency phone survey data, we looked at the issue of sampling bias and we looked at the methodological aspect and at reweighting. And 
in five countries, the survey collected labor market information from all adult members of the household. And we had three countries in Africa, namely Kenya, Malawi, and Nigeria. And there we identified the respondent of the survey and compared it between group differences in employment levels during the pandemic for all working age household members versus the subsample of respondents. And then for Brazil and Com Colombia, we simulate a phone survey following the composition of the high frequency phone survey uh, by selecting only one person per household. And we compare the between group differences in employment levels and changes for all working age household members versus the subsample of selected respondents. So we do this exercise to try to see whether the reweighting induces substantial changes in terms of uh, the sampling biases that potentially arise with the high frequency phone survey data. And we see that by gender, uh, you can see here that when you include all the respondents as opposed to the survey respondents or the reweighted survey uh, sample, you get exactly the uh, very similar um, estimates. And there is absolutely no bias from the high frequency um, phone survey estimate um, in terms of group comparisons. Uh, however, when you look by age, uh, then you see that the reweighting doesn't really help. But uh, in terms of an exception, uh, when the grouping variable is very unbalanced, which is um, in terms of the age variable here, which you can see, um, you get um, at least almost a third um, of young versus adults uh, in terms of the comparison of group differences. Um, then the rewinding methods do not improve the accuracy of the estimated disparities across groups. So uh, the high phone, the high frequency phone survey does work for comparisons in terms of groups across gender. Um, it doesn't work so well by age uh, due to the very uh, unbalanced unrepresentative nature um, across uh, samples. Uh, here, uh, we did, uh, for example, here conduct a correction of bias due to undersampling of some population groups. We combined the high frequency phone survey with national representative pre-pandemic household surveys to estimate a probit model based on observable characteristics. And we did the reweighting factor as one divided by the propensity score coming from that probit estimation. And the reweighting is based on observables that do not materially alter our main results. So you can see the comparison on the top panel, we have it without reweighting and in the bottom panel with reweighting and it's uh, virtually undistinguishable. Um, essentially you get the same estimates for the between group comparisons, which is uh, similar to the point we have already made in terms of the robustness of the results that brings us to our concluding points. Uh, the brunt of the burden in terms of the pandemic, um, when you look at employment losses, has been borne largely by women 
by young workers, by the less educated, and to a lesser extent by urban segments of the workforce. And the fact that uh, women are hit harder by the pandemic is different from past crises. And the penalty faced by women in terms of job loss is largely due to within sector differentials rather than sectoral segregation. So it's a within sector phenomenon indicating the possibility that there is discrimination in terms of women being dismissed first um, within sectors. Also in terms of the rebound, in terms of recovery of employment, there is some evidence that the groups that were hit hardest first were the ones that were able to have larger employment gains in the second and third quarter of 2020. However, we do not know whether the quality of that employment uh, regained in those two quarters is comparable to the job loss in the first quarter of 2020. We don't know if those new jobs are gig economy, transient jobs, or precarious jobs. We don't know if they have benefits or if they have high remuneration. Um, and our sense is that these gains were not sufficient to offset, offset the size of initial losses and that workers are still reeling across the developing world from those initial losses in the first quarter of 2020. So also we conducted some uh, checks in terms of the methodology of the sampling of the high frequency phone survey to look for sampling bias. And we see from evidence of five countries indicating that the high frequency phone survey surveys over state employment rates for the full population, but do reasonably well at tracking overall disparities in employment rates across groups by gender, education, and urban rural groups, although not so well by age. And to end, we have to say that these high frequency phone surveys have been really instrumental in providing real time information for policy formulation in terms of the distributional differences across groups which are estimated in this paper and which are likely to be robust and provide meaningful insights for policymakers. So with this, I conclude. Um, I thank you for your attention. Uh, comments and questions are welcome. I'm Maurice Kugler from the Shard School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And um, you can email me at mkugler at gmu.edu. This was work of the Jobs Watch initiative at the World Bank. And um, we will be very glad to get your feedback on our research, which indicates that the high frequency phone surveys conducted for 40 countries are really instrumental in providing information about which groups were hit hardest. And we see how women, young workers, less educated and urban workers were hit the hardest. And we look forward to continue tracking what's going on in terms of the recovery of those workers as a result of the pandemic. Thank you much, very much for your attention. And I look forward to keeping in touch. Bye.